Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Kayode Oyewole. I work at Ventures Platform, and um, I will be your host for today. Um, thanks, for every, thanks to everyone for joining us on this call. Um, we're excited to have everybody, and more importantly, we're excited to have our guest, Jason and Joko, on the call. Um, I'm just going to just talk about some general house rules, and we'll just kick right in. Um, once again, thanks for joining the call. Um, I understand quite a number of us are, are pretty zoomed out. I mean, somebody reached out to me and say it was pretty zoomed out, but I mean, if Jason was speaking, they definitely was going to be joining the webinar. So it's good to have everybody on the call. Um, basically, we've structured the Zoom um, in a way that everybody on the call is muted, besides the panelists, in this case, Jason. Um, and the way it's going to work is Jason is going to, the agenda for today, Jason is going to speak for about 45 minutes um, and then we'll give opportunities for Q&A. Um, if you have questions to ask, all you need to do is just go to the Q&A box and just type in your questions. Um, after Jason's talk, I'm going to be moderating the Q&A session. So basically, I'm just going to pick all the questions at the chat box, at the Q&A box, and just ask Jason those questions. So if you have questions while Jason is speaking, um, you can just go ahead and just type your questions into the chat box and we'll be sure to answer them um, post, the, post Jason's talk. Um, so yeah, for those that don't know Ventures Platform, I'm just going to give like a quick run through of what we do. Um, Ventures Platform is an early stage fund. Uh, we back some of the boldest entrepreneurs building and solving for some of the hardest problems on the African continent. Um, we, up until today, we've backed about 30 plus companies across multiple sectors, um, health tech, fintech, um, mobility, um, education, um, and we're still currently backing a lot more companies building. Uh, in our opinion, we feel like top times are like the best times or best time for founders to be building. And so it's great to be having this particular session. I mean, what motivated the session? I mean, myself and Kola was also um, a partner at Ventures Platform. Uh, we've been talking back and forth and we realized that there was a bunch of narrative around surviving in COVID. And, and obviously there should be because again, um, lots of companies are seeing their revenues halved in some cases, like just totally up to, um, traded, right? And so there's a bunch of conversation around how you can survive this pandemic. And, and we said discussing, I said, you know what, more importantly will be the fact that people need to actually double down and really build. And we feel like post this pandemic, uh, a lot of really interesting companies are gonna emerge. And so it just made sense to talk about the other side of the narrative, which is how can companies during this time actually just swing for the pencils and, and take bold bets, um, bets that have the potential for massive upsides post, the, post this pandemic and you know into the future. And so we started discussing that and we're like, who best to talk about that than Jason himself, you know? So, um, it's great to have Jason. Uh, I can see people say they want to see my face. Uh, I'm, I'm going to turn on my video for quite, for just like a short while. I, I'm sure you guys will have fun seeing Jason's face, but I'm not sure my face is what you want to see. Uh, but I'm just going to turn it on for like a short period. Um, yes. So this is this is our new new COVID world. I'm just I'm writing in my house, just making this call. Um, so I'm just I mean, Jason doesn't need um, so much introduction. Um, you know, Jason is the founder of Evoco um, Evoco Partners. Um, they they're probably one of Nigeria's um, longest surviving company, and more importantly, um, one of the one of the one of the poster boys for technology in Africa. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. Um, started a bunch of companies, um, Evoco Partners, Rock Studio, um, Irokin, um, Evoco X. I mean, it's received all the major awards, uh, you know, Forbes 10 Young, Entre Young African Millionaires, Entrepreneur of the Year, Most Outstanding Creative. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And also he's funded some of the most interesting companies, you know, um, in the Nigerian startup ecosystem. Right, so it's great to have um, Jason on this call, and I'm basically just going to hand over the imaginary mic to Jason. Jason, once again, it's great to have you on the call. Welcome um, to the VP webinar. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Um, can you guys hear me okay? 100%, Jason. Fantastic, fantastic. So 
that was a pretty uh, big introduction you just gave me there. Um, yeah, uh, I don't think I can live up to that. But what I can, I can tell you right now is that I'm basically hiding from my children. So if you hear me quickly mute, it's because one of my three children are going to come and just disrupt my entire life, which is essentially what they've been placed on this earth to do. Um, so obviously, guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, my voice is a bit off. Uh, I've unfortunately been a bit ill this week. Uh, fortunately, it's not COVID-19. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, I'll try my best to be as, as lucid as possible. And obviously, if... Um, uh, I'll sort of spend less time on myself and more time hopefully answering questions because I kind of feel like that's that's kind of what we're here for, right? To sort of, for me to at least try and share some of the lessons that I've learned over the last um, 15, 16 years where I've sort of been kind of building startups. Um, so I, I think first and foremost, um, you know, I think right now is an absolutely terrible time to do anything. Um, but at the same time, right now is probably the best time to do something. Um, and I think, at least from, from, from my perspective, um, you know, everything I do, I, it needs to be big. Like my wife says, I have a massive problem with overambition. So like everything I do has to be big. It has to be crazy. It has to be like put under all kinds of pressure on me um, and my family and my finances and everything else. But that's just me by nature, right? And I think um, everyone, everyone has a different risk profile. Um, and I think the, the kind of risks you take, I think ultimately don't change um whether things are good or things are bad i think what changes is your ability to uh, like overcome the challenges some challenges are capital some challenges are um are more just your your personal culture and your organization's culture um but more importantly like some challenges ultimately end up being um you know are you able to overcome them and i think when i go back to 2008 which was the last big great recessionary times um you know if, if, if you if i go back then you know, the, the, what became Iroko actually started in 2009. So 2009, again, and this is, this is, what, this is why this sort of, uh, this lockdown period is like nothing for me. Um, 2008, I was essentially, you know, sitting in my house. Uh, I'd been sitting in my house for the best part of four years, trying to build a startup, you know, didn't have any money, so I didn't need, need, really used to leave the house that much. So I could comfortably spend like, you know, an entire week working 18 hours a day and not leaving the house. Um, when, when, when what, what became Rewoko, the actual idea started in 2009, which is the second year um, of the sort of the great last recession that we, we've had. Um, so, hold on one second. I'm sure you can hear them banging in the background. Um, hold on one second. So. Go and charge it. Go on, Go, go, go. Hey guys, sorry. Um, I, I, I did pre-warn you that my son basically thinks that I, he owns this house. So he basically just bangs the door down like he essentially owns the place. Um, so yeah, you know, 2009, big recession. People were kind of getting fired left, right and center. The world was in complete flux. People were losing their homes. And that's essentially the time when the, the seed of Morocco was sowed, right? So um, at least from my perspective, it's, you know, it, 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 you know, these journeys typically end up being like 10, 15, 20 year journey. So when you start kind of doesn't matter. It's a question of like the fact that you start. So when I go back to 2009, I was basically sitting in the house. I had an idea of Morocco at the time. Nobody really believed in me, believed in what I was doing. I think pretty much the entire world thought it was just batshit crazy. Um, Kola, um, Kyle, I hope I'm allowed to swear because that's just me naturally speaking, right? So oh, please, um, go ahead. feel free. Okay, cool. So I can be free. And, no I'm, and I'm here, by the way. <laughs> I can see you. Um, so yeah, like, you know, the, the, the seed of Morocco was born in 2009, which is, I think, comfortably one of the worst times in the last sort of, at least in my lifetime, and I'm 39 at the moment. Um, you know, and, and like, ultimately, no one believed in what I was doing. It made absolutely no sense um, until it made a huge amount of sense, sort of like rolled on five years later. So my view, obviously, is that if you take a 10-year journey, what ultimately happens in any individual year I, I, I think it doesn't really matter. As long as you survive some version of reality, um, you, you kind of be better off for it. And I think at least, you know, now that I'm a father and I essentially dedicate my life to my kids, um, if I look back over the last 10 years um, of my life, the big things which jump out to me, I, married, I got married and I had three children. Everything else outside of that funding rounds, all these other things ultimately don't matter. 
So I think the, the key thing is to have a view that whatever's happening today, you can essentially build beyond it. So you can look 10 years in the future um, and think about what you're trying to build and essentially sort of take, um, take that sort of long-term view. And I think this has probably been the, 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 the biggest the biggest sort of misconception of, of Iwako. Like, Iwako never started off as a, a, a Iwako TV. It, it never was that. It was always just a company to kind of build something in the entertainment space. And our view always was that we we're just going to build something really interesting. Um, and whether it was Nollywood, whether it was international content, whether it was music, whether it was gaming, we just wanted to build a company and just connect ourselves with the millions of fans around the world. So the, the view has always been that, like, our, our, our ambition and our mission has always been much more broader. Um, and it's just a question question of like what do we do on a daily basis on a quarterly basis on a, on a sort of a yearly basis and then a sort of decade year basis to, to kind of like achieve those goals so you know i think you know 100 percent. i think if there's one thing that i would definitely kind of urge you guys not to do is not to get lost in today because today will be finished in a few hours and then there'll be tomorrow and it'll always as long as you're alive and you have good health there'll always be a tomorrow and there'll always be another tomorrow and you'll look back over the life over 10 years, over 20 years, and to sort of just try and make sure you're trying to do the best things that you can do to the best of your abilities. And I think for me, like, you know, in life, I don't really believe in having regrets. Um, I live every day like it's, it's going to be my last, but I, I make sure that I don't kind of get owned by anything in any particular day. So I think right now things sound really rubbish. Um, but like, I, I guess for me, I think I'm being probably the most productive I've been in a really, really long time. I'm doing some of the most ambitious things that I've, I've even tried to do. In, in, in like a really, really long time. Stuff which is like giving me like serious kind of like sleepless nights almost. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's very much like, you know, if the world is going crazy, you should take the opportunity to kind of swing for the fences. Right? And that's just me by nature. Everything I do, it just has to be the, like the biggest thing that, that I can do, at least, at least as far as my ambition can be. Um, and I, I'm actually really sort of big on talking about that and being open about that. Um, at the beginning, people thought it was just me bragging all of the time, but I, I, I tried to sort of share the journey so people actually understand that, you know, when I when I want to when I want to kind of get to why here are the steps that I'm sort of trying to do to get there. And I think that was why, you know, when I when I read back on all my writings and stuff, it's quite kind of clear that I pretty much had the same theme throughout the entire sort of like eight, almost nine years of running the Um So the theme ultimately for me is just to kind of like just keep on swinging. Um, definitely do not live for uh, any particular day and always try and take a very long-term view because whatever is happening today, in a year's time, in two years' time, in three years' time, in 10 years' time, we'll look back and be like, you know what, you know, I, you know in, in the end, like it mattered, but, you know, it didn't really matter that much. So I'm happy to open up for questions now. I prefer questions rather than just speaking because I'm a bit of a rambler when it comes to speaking. So apologies for that. Okay, great. Um, so we're just going to open the floor for questions. Um, I would just, the bunch of questions that came in via the Q&A box. So I'm just going to um, ask those questions and please um, just send in your questions so we can just like um, ask just in some of those questions. So the first question, um, from i'm not sure i get this name saying visual audio the question is why was entertainment the gateway for Iroko to build many other products so it's team is what i know right so um uh when i graduated university i started a student magazine uh it was fashion music lifestyle and essentially it was like media and entertainment right so I used to run on club nights. I used to like, you know, uh, do all kinds of things in sort of the entertainment space, but this is mainly in, in the UK. So for me, it was something which I was naturally uh, um, uh, attracted to. Um, I think in terms of my temperament and the kind of person that I am, um, I definitely feel that like entertainment attracts people like me, uh, kind of like oddball type characters. Um, and I think more importantly, I just attracted to the opportunity, right? Um, and in, in as though that I'm in the entertainment space, I'm probably the the most uh, kind of blase about entertainment in itself. So if you think about it, and I, I think people don't, people, I think people really are really shocked when I say this, but for the most part, like I don't even watch Nollywood movies. Like for the best part, I don't watch them. You know, I wasn't like a massive Nollywood fan. Um, and then I went about sort of like building a business around Nollywood, not at all. Like I've always just been about, it's not just an opportunity. I like the market structure. Um, you know, uh, it's a space which I, which I think I can add value to. 
um, and have kind of taken that sort of perspective as opposed to, you know, sitting down, doing scripts and speaking to stars and going to red carpets, etc. So, you know, I've been in this industry now for like 10 years in Nigeria. I've, I've been on one red carpet in that 10 years period of time. I've been to like maybe a handful of like major events. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've like, if, if, I, if I look at the number of Nollywood people that you think I would have met, I've probably met maybe like a dozen of them. Um, so some of the biggest names in Nollywood, like I've never even been in the same room as them. And I think that's, that's not, not typical of someone who you would think would be like the head of one of the largest entertainment groups in, in Nigeria, right? And I, I think, you know, one of people's biggest critiques is that they feel like I'm a bit aloof, that they don't know me. But for me, I'm just really focused on like, again, sort of like the, the, the sort of the infrastructure of the industry. And I think that's the difference between like how Iroko is being built and how other companies are being built as well. So again, if you look at um, the entertainment space, which other companies even remotely the size of the Iroko in like any way, shape or in form? You know, in terms of the ambition of what we've been, we've been trying to do, um, you know, I, I think definitely like my, my I think my, my so, so far my greatest life's work would definitely be what, 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 we, what I did with my wife on rock. You know, if we go back, um, you know, six years ago, Africa Magic was by far the most dominant pay TV platform um, uh, for Nollywood content across Africa. You know, we swept in there in five years time, we completely changed the game there. And obviously, you know, we, we had an exciting exit at the same time. So for me, it's like, it's, and again, like I, I did the same thing without meeting stars, without, you know, sitting down and having long conversations about scripts. I, I just feel that like, in terms of how I kind of see a market and understand the market and understand an opportunity, I think entertainment is one of those places where um, I feel at least I can definitely express myself in, in a particular way. But again, like it's, it's, it's entertainment right across the spectrum. So um, if you look at uh, uh, the entertainment space, the entertainment space is not just movies. It's not just music. It's gaming as well. So, you know, a lot of what we're doing now, uh, the, the Iroko the you see today will be completely different in a year's time if I have anything to do with it in terms of how we're going as a company. Um, but even like... Um, even like casino, sports, betting, a lot of this stuff also essentially it's entertainment as well. Um, so my view is that like in terms of what I believe I, I could, I'm at least good at and at least have an edge at, and I, I believe there are very few people um, who understand uh, how these markets are structured like me uh, in Africa. I think entertainment is a space which I think will ultimately, I, I don't see myself doing anything beyond that. Um, and that's why you, you don't really see me getting too involved in fintech. I, I don't really speak about fintech too much. Um, can I try to talk about things that I understand and what I know. Um, you know, you don't see me talking about uh, Bitcoin because I don't really understand Bitcoin. You know, I talk about things that I have a passion for and I understand and I do them on a, on a kind of on a regular basis. So for me, like Iroko was just a, almost like a holding company to kind of express myself in the entertainment space and that's right across the spectrum. Um, but again, like, you know, you'll see over the next sort of nine to 12 months, how much of a dramatic change Iroko will show um, in terms of what we're trying to do in the entertainment space. Um, for Thanks, Jason, for the response. Uh, we have a bunch of other questions, but before I dive into those questions, I have a couple questions for you. Um, so, I, I mean, from, from a founder perspective and thinking about starting a company, I mean, usually a good chunk of the founders you meet seem to always come from an idea perspective, right? But, but my thinking is that one of the hardest decisions you make about starting a company is figuring out what, what markets to go after. So, I'm curious as to your thoughts on how do founders filter for what problem to solve and what market to go after. That's the first question. And the second question is, I mean, the current pandemic, COVID-19, has forced certain behaviors on users, right? So, I mean, typically we would have had this in a conference, in a conference hall somewhere in Lagos and would have got, gotten a bunch of people to come be part of this. But now Zoom calls um, and a bunch of other products and virtual products and services and now irregular thing do you think this first behavior would be something people would you know learn going forward or do you think this will fundamentally change right and you begin to see companies build product and service around this sort of first behavior do you think this is something that would last post covid and it would become an, a new normal where people would basically prefer virtual interaction prefer prefer virtual um, buying and selling of products and services or do you think over time, human beings will gravitate to their normal way of living their lives, right? And how the companies build for some of those first behaviors in a way that the product beyond just this pandemic, you know, can, um, can, can last for or can last for a longer period. Hi, sorry, I, I missed the beginning of that question. 
Um, apologies. If you could just summarize it again. I heard bits of it, but then I, I lost you guys for a minute because I keep on switching internet for some reason. Okay, so the first question is how do entrepreneurs filter for what product and what market to go after? And the second question is um, some of the first behavior, some of the first behavior that COVID has, has, has brought about, do you think post this pandemic, people would basically just follow those sort of lifestyle or do you see things fundamentally changing and people returning to their previous way of life post the pandemic? Sorry, it cut up again, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and answer the first one. Um, so I think, look, um, if I'm not mistaken, one of the questions was, do we feel that the virtual sort of connectivity in terms of being able to onboard customers will change now that the pandemic and the lockdowns have happened? I think that was one of the questions, right? Yeah, so, so, so the, quest, the question is, people have switched to a virtual way of interaction and of doing things, of onboarding customers and doing a bunch of things. Do you think post the pandemic, um, customers would basically want to return to their regular way of doing things? Or do you think this whole digital acceleration would become a thing going forward? So I hope um, things don't return to how they were. Um, in the past, and I, I guess let me give you let me give you my let me give you my example. So, um, you know, when I first came to Nigeria, twenty ten, um, I used to spend huge amounts of time starting starting traffic, meeting people, like going for meetings, meetings which I knew which I could have essentially done, like over the phone. Like it didn't require me to be there in person, um, but I had to go there anyway. Um, and I think the culture, especially in corporate Nigeria, uh, is you go to, for a meeting, you sit in someone's office for like an hour, um, they fuck around with your time, and then you basically, um, and you basically, uh, you know, may or may not, you know, have a five minute meeting after spending like three hours trying to get there. And actually, it was interesting that there's, there was a really big uh, record company back in 2011. I think this is when I actually stopped going to meetings in Nigeria. Um, when... You know, the guy was like, look, come and sign this contract. It's a big music company. Uh, we're just launching into the music space. Get in there, we're going to be a big queue. Um, and he was like, you know, come to my offices. I'm in Lecky One. At the time, I was in Festac. Um, again, it was a nightmare for me to leave Festac at the time, for me to get to the island. We're talking about, like, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon. I spent, like, four hours. Try I spent four hours uh, in a car trying to get to his offices in Lecky One. As I got there, he was leaving for the airport. He says, oh, do you know what, like, don't worry, like, and I bought the contracts with me. He was just supposed to put his, his, his signature, it, signature to it. And he was literally like, you know what, let me hold this. I'm going to the UK. Like, let me sign in the UK and I'll scan it back. And I'm just like, dude, what the, I didn't say what the fuck, but in my mind, I was like, dude, what the fuck? I spent four hours coming here for you to sign this document. And you literally can't even give me the time to, to sign the document. Like, what the fuck? And that day I told myself, you know what, like, I'm not going for meetings anymore. So... If, if I look at the last 10 years of me being in Nigeria, like it's almost, it's very rare that someone actually meets me. I'm going to the meeting, why? Let's try and find a way to do it. Like either WhatsApp or via phone. Like you don't need to sit and stare at me and look into my eyes. We're not seducing, we're not falling in love. We could do, we could do a deal without having to meet me in person. And you can form a relationship with somebody without actually having to meet them in person. And I think it's interesting, even I'm sure Colin will tell you, uh, he's on the phone here as well. Colin, have we even seen more than 10 times in our lives? Nah, I don't think so, man. But I, I don't think so. If it's so, 10 times, I'll be surprised. Nah, I, probably three times, but like we're... <laughs> super, and, and so much so much has exchanged hands since then. <laughs> We've done so many things. And, 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 and I think that's, that's, that's the crazy... There, there are very few people in this world outside of my family who literally will see me more than 10 times. And you know what? I think for me, it's the only way I scale... We don't need to have conversations every day. Everything can be done through WhatsApp. In fact, emails I'm not even interested in. So I think just the ability, especially in our community, in the tech community, to be able to get away from the need to actually um, sit down and like have a conversation, I think it's just, I think it's long. I hope we don't go back to that. I truly hope that people will see the value in being able to be, get on a phone call uh, or get on a Zoom call or do something via WhatsApp where something takes five or 10 minutes which shouldn't take like two or three visits and like 10 hours of your time wasted in traffic or something else. So my hope, my, my hope is that like the, the, the work, the work sort of flow of Nigeria is disrupted enough 
so people, especially like the older style employers, understand that you don't have to basically like force your people to go and have meetings. And I think for me, like that is super, 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 super important. So my, my hope is that we don't go back to how we were before, because we surely have to be able to have learned something in, in, from this pandemic. Great, Jason. Um, the the next question. I mean, there, there was a question around how do you filter for what for how do you filter for for what markets or what opportunities to go after. But I'll just there's a question here around um, what's your. This is from Ben Chill. It says, "What's your investment? What's your investment thesis around investing in African companies? And do you focus more on the market size a startup is trying to play, or do you, are you more focused on building the right product?" So it's actually, it's an interesting story and I'm probably going to bite myself in the neck by saying this. So I think people who like investing are very different from like people like me. So Bashan and I, very early 2013, we basically done a bunch of investments. Uh, and during that process of pouring two and a half, three million dollars, I realized I actually don't like investing. And actually, it was actually Mark Essien who taught me this, a very brutal lesson. So Mark and I had completely different operating styles. We have completely different operating styles. And me as an operator, I'm like, Mark, you should do it like this. He's like, no, Jason, I'll do it like this. I'm like, no, Mark, you should do it like this. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, this is how you do things. He's like, you know what, Jason, this is my company. I'm going to do it like the way I want to do it. And we actually fell out for like a really long time because I thought he was like an arrogant fuck. But in the end, I realized that, you know, in the end, it's his company, right? And I can't run the company for him. So I actually realized that, to be honest with you, like, do I really want to sit around trying to solve other people's problems? Not really, I have my own fucking problems. Like, do I really want to spend time, um, you know, going into deep details about operations and stuff like that? No, I actually don't want to do it, spend that time. Um, do I really want to spend time even going to see these operations? You know, I'm not interested. You know, come and sit on my board. Like, I, again, to today, I sit on no one's board because my own board and my own board processes, I, I find them quite like a challenge, right? I'd rather just be focusing on the business. So for me, like, what, what, what you require to become a great investor, I, I don't think I have those skills. So in, in, in order for me to be um, successful at what I do, and that more importantly, um, you know, if you think about 2013, I, I was just having my first, uh, my first child, and I now have three kids. And again, you can hear them sort of like disrupting this phone call as we speak. You know, like the time that I have is now reduced because I want to spend time with my kids. So for me to now spend time on, you know, investees and having conversations and filtering, like I just don't have the DNA for that. So I guess my contribution was to start blogging and sharing my experiences and scaling that. So for me, it's like, and again, if you look at when I started blog, I started, I started blogging before I had my first son because I felt that, you know what, my contribution has to be something. Let me share my own story. Let me share some unpopular opinions. Let me basically be, just uh, a perspective out there just to kind of help guide people um, in how they want to essentially build their businesses or whatever. So for me, it was easier for me to write extensively. Uh, I, I think I've got, a, I've got a pretty strong body of work over the last seven or eight years, um, which, I, 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 which I've been largely um, uh, fortunate to have the time to be able to write. Um, and I, I hope to feel that that has kind of offered some kind of insight into how I'm thinking and some kind of contribution to how people can build their businesses, et cetera. So, as of right now, like I'm, 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 I'm not an investor in individual companies. If you came to me for an investment, I'll probably circulate you and try and help you raise money from people who do know how to make investments. Um, what, what I prefer to do is, um, is take a million dollars of my own money and basically try and build something. So because like I, 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 I see myself as a founder. I see myself as someone who knows how to build shit. I see myself as having a very clear strategic perspective. But again, like I, I typically focus on things that I know, right? So if I, if I look at my last 10 years, um, definitely in, in this, my last 15 years have been in media uh, entertainment. That's basically been the last 15 careers since I left university. So when I think of Iwoko, music made sense because again, music people, movie people are essentially the same people in some regards. Um, it's talent, it's content, it's distribution, etc. cetera. Um, when I think about, uh, you know, my, my, my next big move in terms of what I, what I, my, my, my family been investing in over the last couple of years, it's kind of, it's another form of entertainment, but it's like real money gaming. So we're talking about, 
you know, sports betting, we're talking about casino, we're talking about bingo, we're looking at poker. So the view is that like, it's, it's entertainment. Again, the people are very sort of similar in terms of there's a tech angle, there is a marketing angle, there's a communication angle, there's a brand angle. And I think I can basically pull all those things together. So again, if you, if you, look, at the, if you look at some of the wealthiest people in entertainment, they're the people who own casinos. They're not necessarily people who own Hollywood. Um, so for me, I'm essentially still investing in things which I ultimately know. Uh, me, at least, I stick to a very narrow space that I know. Um, and I, speak, I stick to a space where I feel that I have at least the skill set um, and the ability to kind of to sort of blitz scale something. Um, and I prefer to use my own money to do it. So again, just to put into context, in Morocco, I had no money, so I put no money in. Um, for some of the new ventures, uh, um, in terms of my gaming group, which I'm, I'm sort of like building uh, as executive chairman, you know, I've put seven hundred thousand dollars of my own money in there. If I had more money, I'd put more money in there. So for me, it's like it's uh, it's a question of like what 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 do I believe that I I think I could be better at than, than most people, um, or at least top ten in Africa, and then I basically just sort of like double down and focus on that. But it has to be very close to something that I that I at least know and I feel I have an edge. So it's very unlikely for you to think, you, you'll not most likely see me ever start in the fintech because I genuinely don't have enough understanding of the mechanics. And I don't really have a deep base of knowledge to kind of like really have an impact there. Great. Um, great. There's a question around um, how do you handle the constant Naira devaluation in your business? Um, yeah. And there's also a question around, you know, I'm just going to match both questions. What kept you going in 2009 when everyone thought you were crazy? So let me, let me ask that one. So like um, people, so people think I was bragging in 20, like, I mean, when I first came onto the scene, people like this guy's too arrogant, he's bragging, he knows everything. Then I was the most arrogant like guy that I, in the whole wide world. Like I just believed that I was destined for greatness. Like you, do not, you would not have met a more insufferable person than me um, then. So at the time I truly believed that, you know what? I'm special, I'm blessed, I'm gonna be a winner. I'm gonna be, a, I'm gonna be a, a millionaire. Like this is just my destiny. Like it, it never even occurred to me that I could fail. I just, I, I, that's sort of like how I've, I've always been. I just believe that, you know what, like, whatever I want to do, I'll just do it. It's just a question, it's, do I, can I try hard enough? Um, and no matter the failure, I always feel that like, all I need to do is, it's not that I don't have the tools, it's the timing, it's, if something's gonna take a year, 10 years, I'll be there for the 10 years to figure it out. So for me, I, I think it's just like, you know, I, I, again, I wrote an article way back when I was, I was broke, I was getting stupid, right? Like, I was broke, no, had no money, so I had nothing to lose. Um, two, uh, I was super arrogant, so I just believed that I was destined and had complete delusions of grandeur. Um, and, and three, I was just stupid in the sense that I could just was willing to throw everything at it. Um, and do you know what? I'm, I'm not broke anymore, but I'm definitely sort of like confident, less so arrogant. Um, and I'm definitely stupid when it comes to stuff like that. Like, I, I, will, I will bet my house every single time. My wife is scared of me when it comes to this thing. I will bet our kids' school fees. I will bet everything on a business if I truly believe in it. And even till today, like, she's just like, you know what, I just, you need to be careful. You need to protect us, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I'm just an extremist and I will literally, like, I, I will literally bet my house if I needed to on something, but if I truly believed in it. Um, and that, that's that confidence of sort of like, you know, being able to bet on yourself and see things through. Um, so right now, like, what, what, what I see today, like, again, I've, I've, I've been sort of trying to build companies for the last 15 years. So I think there's, there's nothing, there's very few things I haven't seen, or there's very few things that I've seen that I've seen which will scare me. Um, and I think less, like, things that used to scare me before will never scare me now, because in the end, like, if my, if my, if my daughter is ill, that fucking scares me. Like, that terrifies me. If my company goes to close down, oh, fuck it, I'll build another company. Like, you know, so people will call me out on Twitter, who gives a shit? Like, I'm, I'm concerned for my family. Everything else, like, is fair game as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and, and the second question is the Naira devaluation. Yes, yes, that, that's it. You know, not, not to sound, un, sound unpatriotic, un uh, and I'm sure there are some sort of some card carrying APC members uh, here. Um, look, the Naira was always going to devalue, right? I think if you look at the history of Nigeria over the last like 20 years, every sort of five to six years has been a big corrective event. And that corrective event usually is around the, the, the Naira devaluation, right? So when 2009, don't forget, 2009, there was a big Naira devaluation. Um, and that big Naira devaluation knocked out high TV and basically put them out of business. 
put a lot of people in really dark places, knocked out the equity markets, did massive, 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 massive damages um, uh, to a lot of people very quickly. So again, coming into Nigeria for the first time in 2010, all you heard was negative stories about how many people had lost their money, how many people weren't working anymore, how many banks was co collapsing. So if you go back to that time, like there's always been turmoil in, in Nigeria. And I think it's just a question of how you manage that turmoil. Um, in 2015, 2014, 2015, um, again, like, you know, I watched the Naira devalue massively again. So going from 166 to, um, to 360, in, in, or at one point it was like 500, then to 360, I think showed that well actually you know what this business is actually not a uh, not not a fact not a sort of like a bit of a scary business in that fact um so and i think iraq is super fortunate in the sense that um you know we've always been able to to generate a huge amount of uh, foreign exchange so the vast majority of iraq is revenues um and especially when we were driven by rock was largely in euros and dollars so we've largely not really had um, uh, a massive sort of impact on our on our on our business. So again, if you look at the 2015 uh, Naira devaluation, We then started to look at, well, you know what, we thought is going to be another Naira devaluation. Um, let's try and get Naira debt. So we got the BOI loan for like 500 million Naira. We had another opportunity to get the BOI loan for 500 million Naira. Um, in fact, earlier this year, we were trying to get a billion Naira from the BOI because our view was that, you know what, we hold dollars. So if the Naira devalues again, it just makes it cheaper for us to basically kind of uh, to build the business right. So I think for, for, for a company like Iwoko, we don't really have a massive Naira exposure. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of the sort of the patriots amongst us believe that, you know, I'm just, I'm, we're just out there, you know, taking advantage of Nigerians, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, our, our product pricing is probably the most cheapest you will ever see for any kind of product like this anywhere in the world. We're, we're literally like 3,000 naira a year, 5,000 naira a year. It's literally just like, it's crazy cheap, like crazy, crazy, crazy cheap. Um, and we're able to do that because we kind of like, we balance these type of risks, right? So um, again, like, you know, when we had the, when we saw the Naira looking to value um, over the last few weeks, you know, the first thing I did was I switched my focus back to the international markets. So right now um, I spend a lot of my time trying to grow our subscribers in North America. So 70% um, of our international subscribers sit in Canada, US and the UK. Although Nigeria and Ghana are our biggest two markets um, independently, the vast majority of revenue still comes from, um, from North America and the UK and Ireland. So right now, like uh, in terms of where the company looks, what it look, looks like it's wanted to do for the rest of the year, uh, essentially we expect to, or at least I expect to spend most of my time focused on generating foreign currency. Um, so I think, I think we have the flexibility um, to, to be able to do that. And I guess just, just to kind of like give, give an example of like how I future-proofed other businesses um, into this. So um, uh, Blackbet, which is uh, uh, one of the gaming groups, which I'm, I'm sort of like uh, sort of uh, executive chairman, from day one, there were two risks that I needed. I knew I needed to mitigate from day one. Uh, um, risk one, uh, the re regulatory risk. Um, again, I've never dealt with regulators in Africa, but from experience, regulators can be kind of you know prone to really regulating. So my view was that, look, I want to be as compliant as possible, but I don't want to put all of my eggs into one basket, say in Nigeria, basically build like a really big business in Nigeria, and then regulator will come and change something, and I'll just be basically like, you know, screwed. So my view from day one was that, like, we need to diversify regulatory risk, we need to diversify currency risk. So right now, um, you know, Blackbird is in Nigeria, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going into, uh, we're going to Tanzania, we're going into uh, Kenya, we're going into Malawi, we're going into Mozambique, we're going into Zambia. You know, let's, we, we, let's, we have sports licenses across all of these different countries. So the Naira is devalued, yeah, and it's going to devalue pretty aggressively over the next, um, over the rest of 2020. But you know what? Kenya shillings is just fine. Malawi and Quattro is just fine. Tanzania shillings is just fine. So if there's a 50, 60% devaluation in Nigeria, it hurts everybody in Nigeria, but because the group is diversified on a currency basis, it, it essentially has like a very limited impact. But then this is because, again, I wanted to build a really big business. 
I wanted to sort of diversify regulatory and um, and uh, currency risks because they are, they are the big things which will basically mess up any of your investment plans in Africa really quickly. So I think from my perspective, if, you're, if, you, have a, if you have a Nigerian only business um, and you're not thinking or, or you're not trying to figure out how to get foreign currencies or you don't have the pricing power where you can just adjust your prices in real time as a narrative values, then I think you need to figure out a plan to basically do that. Um, and again, like I, I travel a huge amount. I've been to seven African countries this year. And you think that you know, you know, the world kind of shut down in mid-March, but before then I've been to like seven or eight African countries um, already. Uh, so I'm used to traveling, I'm used to dealing in new markets. I'm kind of open to sort of being everywhere. Um, I'm used to living on a plane. So for me, I, I think just the ability to diversify the currency risk, I think it has to be an absolute um, uh, sort of prerequisite for building businesses in Africa. Because that, that is one thing which we'll be talking about in five years' time. 2020, 2025, we're talking about now devaluation again. It just happens. And, and, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a currency like the RAND, which can kind of bounce back from that. We, just, we basically devalue in one direction, typically. That's an interesting take. So I just want to double down on some of the comments you've given, right? So with respect to um, diversifying your operations, right? How do you approach... Um, setting up in multiple markets, um, language barriers, localization, um, setting up a team. I'm just curious as to how you go about doing all that for, for a company that, uh, that is typically just starting. So, you know, I saw a report at some point that one of the biggest issues for companies, you know, that, that needs to failure is basically um, growing too fast and expanding um, across geographies too soon. So I'm curious as to how you think about that and how you approach it. Oh, do you know what I think? Like, it's very easy to burn a lot of money trying to be expansive. But I guess I'm okay with that. I would rather burn money being trying to be expansive and be ambitious than be cautious and sort of like stay in one market and try to figure these things out. Um, and I think, you know, I, I guess, again, here's, here's, uh, here's the difference between, uh, I guess, um, a lot of sort of Nigeria is such a big market that people believe that like as long as I can make it in Nigeria I'll make it and that is true 100% true but at the same time like just the regulatory risk the macro risk for Nigeria it's so scary even I've been operating in Nigeria for the last 10 years now I'm still scared of how I've operated in Nigeria because I don't fully feel like I understand Nigeria and Nigerians so my view is always like you know what um you know, setting up a company in some of these markets is really cheap. So you can set up a company for $1,000 in most of these countries. Now, $1,000 granted is a lot of money for a lot of people. But I think for some of the people in the tech space, to set up in five or six countries and spend like $10,000 doing that, that, isn't your, that, that, that shouldn't be your problem. At the same time, it's like, it's how much time do you spend on your existing business versus the, what's happening around the corner? Um, and I think for me, I think, for the, for the gaming space strategically, I believe the edge was to basically get as big as possible, as fast as possible to survive what I believe would be the movement from 500 independent gaming companies across Africa to like 50. To go from 500 to 50, the only way you can be one of those 50 if, you, if, you, if you're really big. And if you gave me $10 million to invest in, a, uh, let's say in a, in a sports betting brand in Nigeria, I'd rather take that money and try and launch in 10 countries. Because you know why? The likelihood of me making it in Nigeria against some of the big guys is very limited uh, versus my ability to go into markets where there's like a handful of operators. So again, like, you know, I was in Mozambique earlier this year. Mozambique is by far not even close to um, as competitive as Nigeria. You know, I was in Malawi. There's very few operators there. I was in, uh, uh, I was in, Zam I was in Zambia, DRC. So some of these countries have very few operators. And they're not big countries and people don't really give a shit about them. And that's basically where you make a lot of margin. And even if you look at some of the sort of the telcos or the pay TV operators, some of the smallest markets are actually some of the most profitable. Some of the most biggest markets, especially like Nigeria, people really struggle to make money there because it's super competitive. So my view is that like from a strategic perspective, if you want to get big, get fast, I think you've got to go, I think you'll go across Africa. And for me, I guess I'm not like, you know, I'm not married to like Nigeria as an end one bill. And I kind of feel like it's sometimes it's actually easier making money in a lot of other countries than it is to make actually making money in Nigeria. And then finally, like, what people don't understand is that, like, and I never, I never fully understood this until earlier this year. Um, if, you are a, if you're a Nigerian and you land in, like, Malawi, your reputation lands with you. 
So people are scared of you. People are genuinely scared. Like they're scared of, they're scared of you in a sense that they respect you. They respect what you're saying. They know that you're aggressive. They know that you're here to do business. That they like Nigerians' decision making. So Nigerians' reputation, yes, it has its dark side. But a lot of other African countries love doing business with Nigerians because they're, they're so direct, they're so ambitious. So like that, carrying that Nigerian badge actually is, a, I think, is a massive uh, edge in most parts of Africa. And again, let me, just, let me end it on this. So there was, there, was a, um, there was somebody who was trying to do a move uh, in Uganda uh, when I was trying to sort of negotiate acquiring a company there. And I, was, I started laughing. I was like, dude, like, are you guys fucking kidding me? Like, I operated in Nigeria for like eight years. What the fuck are you guys going to do to me that I haven't seen before? Like, like, just, like just calm down. Like, whatever you're, I can see what you're doing. Like, I've seen it before. I've seen it in Nigeria. Whatever you guys can do in Uganda, I fucking see it in Nigeria. Can just cool down. Let's get this deal done. Let's move forward. Like, you guys aren't smart. You're not fucking aggressive. I've seen worse. Like, so please, let's get this deal done and let's get it done. And you know what? In the end, they realize that, you know what? That's true. This motherfucker's come from a place where people are sort of like, you know, tearing themselves to shreds trying to win market share. Like, how the fuck am I going to fuck over Nigeria? Think about it. Most other African countries, they can't fuck over Nigerians. That's not how it works. So I think there's an edge of being a Nigerian and having been battle scarred in like, in Iraq or in Afghanistan. And again, I, I, I like to use these war uh, things. Being in Nigeria is like being in Iraq. You now come to like Connecticut and you want to become like a cop after be, doing two or three tours of, in the... Uh, in, um, in, in Iraq, there's nothing that they can show you that you haven't seen before. So I think there is an edge to be in the Nigerian, being op- having operated in the Nigeria and having that ambition and that aggressiveness that like most other African countries, unfortunately, just don't have. I, I, if they have it, I've never seen it before. So I, I would definitely say that being expansive, there's no, for me, there's no downside other than the cost. If you can afford to do it, then do it, man. That's a really interesting perspective. Uh... So I have a question from Mo, and it says, um, what are the best opportunities you see during this um, COVID world? So actually, you know, the best opportunities by far, I think, is content. Um, so it's interesting. So I, some of you guys may know, obviously, I've been blogging for the last seven years. So I've essentially been with a free seven-year um, a, a free seven year, uh, trial period for my blogs and stuff. So in, in, I think it was... February 1, I put my blogs behind a, um, a uh, uh, paywall. And um, a lot of people were like, who, like who's going to pay for your writing? I'm like, you know, I have no idea, but I'm going to put it there behind. I'm going to put it there. I think it'll be deep voice. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to build a community. We're going to see what's happening. And what's, what's actually interesting is that um, over the last, what, uh, February, March, April, over the last three months, um, I, I genuinely shocked the number of people who are paying for content, for good quality content and for communities. Um, and that was, that was an opportunity where I don't think very many companies in Nigeria have actually sort of looked at how do I actually get people to pay? You know, I'm a subscription guy. I understand consumer internet. So I'm used to, I'm used to figuring out ways to get people to pay. And I, I feel like, um, you know, what, I, what I'm calling essentially in Jokuzili, which is essentially something I'm kind of doing in my spare time around things that I'm interested in. Um, so I've essentially taken my interest, which I spend like maybe 10, 15 hours a week on, and I'm basically monetizing them, which is crazy when you think about it. So I, 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 I'm, in, I'm excited about startups. I'm excited about building. I put a paywall behind that, and I'm monetizing it. I'm excited about triathlons. Like anyone who's followed my journey knows that I spend a lot of time training, doing triathlons, running, cycling, swimming, whatever. I basically put a paywall around that, and people are subscribing. I'm a trader. Like I love to do trades. I'm super risky um, and sort of uh, crazy when it comes to that. I build a community around trading. You know, and uh, you know, most people didn't believe that was possible when I first started doing that. Um, but, I, I, but I can tell you, point blank, that I'll, I'll most likely make more money in terms of those, those three businesses that I started like three months ago than I do on my annual salary in Iwako. So I think there are opportunities if you're willing to take them. And I think the biggest opportunity around is content. People are literally stuck at home doing it. A lot of people are stuck at home doing nothing. And if you, can, if you can create something which they're willing to pay for or create an opportunity which at least helps them maybe wealth, become healthy or wealthy, I think they're the key things. They're the key happiness triggers for anybody. Like I've never seen someone be like really upset about, oh my God, like I've lost weight and now I look better than I did before. Like no one's upset about that. Oh my God, poor me, I made more money yesterday than I did today. People are upset about that. So for me, I look for like things that kind of make people happy. 
and make people really entertain. Um, and I kind of like figure out how, to, how, how can I monetize that. But again, it's, it's a direct link from what I'm doing at Iwako. It's a direct link from what I'm doing at the, uh, at the gaming company. So again, I'm literally sticking to media and entertainment. That's basically what I know. So I think people need to think about what they know and figure out how to monetize that. Great. Um, so, so we have a question. Next question is from Armfree. Free. And this question is, uh, I'm a co-founder of a SaaS solution that is fully bootstrapped. The slog has been tough to say the least. We do have a clear product roadmap. However, funding is the challenge. How would you advise we go about raising funds? So, I okay, guess so anyone who's seen me speak recently, I'm kind of really anti uh, raising money uh, if you don't have to. Um, and I say this, as you all know, from absolute personal experience. Um, I'll say it before, I'll say it again. Iraq was raised $35 million. I think we could be in exactly the same place as we are right now with 10. And Iraq is not. Uh, 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 a cheap business. Actually, there is no, uh, I, again, I'm, people can quote me if I'm wrong, but I'm yet to see a similar startup in terms of content and distribution of content over on the internet who spent less than $30 million to basically build like a really big company. So the typical kind of like starting stage for the companies that we're building are somewhere in the sort of the, the, the um, 30 to $50 million range. And then they go up to $100 million plus. And, and obviously like you have, uh, people who started with a billion dollars, for example. So I think it, it depends on the nature of your company. It depends on what you actually want the money to do. So I know somebody, you know, it's really attractive. It's really sexy to raise money. Um, my sense is like, how can you constrain your capital and actually end up in a much stronger place um, with much less capital? And I think as a founder, the only thing you need to care about, the absolute only thing you need to care about is if there is a liquidity event, if someone wants to buy your company or if somebody wants to, or if you want to list your company, how much of that is yours? Straight up and down, how much of that is yours? Simple as that, nothing like that. Um, so for, um, uh, for, for, for me, it's like, it's, if you raise more money, you lose more equity in your, in your company. If there's, an, is there, if there's a, a sale, um, then you could end up having much, 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 much less than you would if you, if you had it. And in 20, what was it, 2016, 2015, 2016, I realized this. So two of my mentors sold their companies. One sold his company uh, for $500 million. Uh, the other one sold his company for about $70 million. The one who sold his company for $70 million um, had 75% of the company. Um, uh, and he actually ended up making more money than the person selling money for $500 million companies, $500 million. So I think, you know, what's the likelihood of you building a $50 million company versus a $500 million company? And my view is that like, you know, there's a chance that you may, um, there's a chance that you may uh, build a $10 million company or a $20 million company, but is there a chance you build a $500 million company? Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, even me as ambitious as I am, I, I'm yet to see the sort of data points to justify that. So for all intents and purposes, I would assume um, that's not the case. Um, so for me, it's like, if you could hold on to more of your company as possible uh, without raising money, especially if you can kind of bootstrap it, then 100% you should do that. 100% you should do that. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's rich of me saying that because I've gone through the process, but I think if I'm not telling you that, then I don't know who else will tell you that. So I think, you know, any, anyone who comes to me say, hey, Jay, I've got a $30 million term sheet. The first thing I'm going to ask them, like, one, do you need that money? Two, like, what are the terms attached to that? Three, are you going to retire off that money in terms of, are they going to, you know, carve aside two or three million dollars for you to kind of make you okay? So you don't have to worry about working for the rest of your life where why you swing for the fences. If they're not doing that, then fuck that, man. Don't, don't do it. Um, and failed with the founders essentially making nothing than companies that could have been successes but at a much smaller scale. So my view is always, um, if you don't need to raise money, uh, don't. If you, raise, if you need to raise money, know what you're raising it for. And when you're raising that money, always assume that that money might be the last money that you actually ever raise. So my sense is that if you're building a SaaS company and you want to kind of get it $25, $30 million in, in value, if you could do that on $500,000, fucking fantastic. Because doing it on $5 million, like it will be un, it will be a very very difficult thing to do. 
Well, whilst we're talking about fundraising, there are a bunch of questions around fundraising. I'll just try and aggregate a bunch of them together. So there's a question around, um, I mean, largely investors typically like funding people that they know or people that come to them via referral. And this person's question is around what do you do as a founder with limited network um, and you need to fundraise? How do you go about fundraising? Right. There's a question around when is the right time to, to raise funds. Um, and at the early stage, what's a decent, um, what's a decent equity to let off um, to early stage investors? Um, and there's a question around just general hacks around fundraising and how you went about um, raising funds for your local. So I think the biggest, so I'll start with the question first. We never went out for the first five years of Iwoko. We never went out to raise money. The money just came to us. And I was, I was spoiled, completely spoiled because of that. So again, like, you know, if you go back to the early days of Iwoko, um, within a year of launching Nollywood Love, again, there was, there was a Iwoko company, but we were a YouTube channel. We were making 50, 60, $70,000 every month of that someone knew for $30,000 a month was profits. So we're making $30,000 a month in profits. So when, when Tiger Global came, they were like, who is this guy who's basically made him $30,000 a month from his fucking room? I was literally in my room in Festac, in my house, making $30,000 a month in profits. So what can you possibly tell me to get me excited other than throwing a big number at me? And the first valuation for Iraq was like $9 million uh, post money on a $3 million raise. And I was like, why would I take that? Like, you've got to make it higher. So they made it $12 million as a post money base, which in yeah, my time, which just didn't make any sense. But I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'll, I'll take the money, right? Um, so for me, I think the key thing about raising money is if you don't need it. Um, investors love it when you don't need the money. And the more and more you tell investors you don't need their money, um, the more and more they will basically fall in love with you and want to fund you when the time comes. So great, in, in, in the end, it's, there's no hacks about raising money. If you have something of value or you have a position or you have a perspective which is unique and they believe you can execute on that perspective, then you will get money. That's not a problem, you will get money. But if you start doing pretty presentations, I've got this MVP in my mind without no users, without no nothing, I think it's very, very difficult to raise money like that. So for me, I think in the end, it always comes down to the company. So if you've got a really great product or a great service, which is, you know, crushing it in its own little way and people love it and you're generating enough cash flow to pay for your bills and maybe a little bit extra, then I, I don't think you ever have a problem finding investors. And even if you don't find investors, you still have a business. And, and let's, let's be real, like, investors are not the greatest arbiters of value, right? Investors aren't necessarily the people who fully understand, like, what the value looks like in, like, five years' time. So for me, again, I was very, very fortunate early on that for the first five years, people just come and raise money. They'll just come and raise money. Um, the first time I went out to properly go and raise, so the second time I went out to properly raise money in 2018, hired an investment bank, went out, spoke to like a whole bunch of VCs and private equities and a whole bunch of other things. We felt like you wouldn't believe. People were just like, yeah, we love this, but you know what? We don't like this. this why have you guys taken so long? Is there really a market there? These guys are going to crush you. Those guys are going to crush you. This is kind of fuck, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, like the investors didn't really understand what we were doing, why we were doing it. Maybe I was really, really good at explaining it. But for whatever reason, we, Iroko failed to raise money. But what came out of that actually, which was really interesting, was that private equity firms looked at our business and they were like, actually, do you know what? This Iroko TV stuff that you're doing is fine and well, but we don't really understand it. But it was this thing you're doing here, this rock thing, we love that business. What does, and it, like, for the life of me, we never would have split it out, but if like, they asked us, what Rock, I want to see what Rock is doing as a standalone business without funding the millions and millions of dollars of losses for Rock TV and the shit you're doing over there. What does this business look like? When we, when investors were able to, or at least private equity firms, not investors, but private equity firms, look at that business and realize that, you know what? That was a, a fantastically profitable business. Like the, the profits for that business were more than Iroko TV revenues. And it, 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 we, I, I, even though I was there and I was the founder and I was the CEO, I never would have even like realized that. 
was too busy, busy kind of like building these things simultaneously. So when they identified that, um, when they identified that as the um, uh, valuable business, and they were like, you know what, here's a term sheet. Um, and I've actually, I've, I've never, uh, I've never sort of put the number out there because I wasn't allowed to, and I'm not going to put the real number out there, but I put the original term sheet we got to sell the rock business was $35 million. So we went out to raise money, we, fight, we failed through Rocker TV, but someone was like, you know what, that business there, we think is worth $35 million. We want to buy that business for $35 million. Now we didn't sell it for $35 million, we sold it for less than that, but it gives you a sense of the value we created without even fucking knowing it. Okay, hey, um, interesting take, Jason. Um, and so I, I guess the, the, the answer to those question is go create value. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty important. It, I mean, you know how they say chase, chase money and you get advice and chase advice, you get money. It always feels like for companies that don't want to raise money, um, term sheets just seem to follow that because investors like those sort of businesses, right? Um, I have a question here from Shola and a bunch of questions also around the same team. So I'm just going to, um, uh, just ask those questions um, together. Um, and the question is, what's the impact of the lockdown on your people's productivity? I'm assuming it's referring to your staff productivity and how are you handling, especially minding the past situation and people not being very familiar with remote working in Nigeria? And also, there's also a question around um, how do you um, ensure that during this period, your people stay motivated considering some of the layoffs and the salary um, um, reductions that have happened in Iraq over the past couple of weeks, how do you ensure you keep motivating your staff to just come um, and turn up 100% every single day? And there's a question around managing productivity, considering the reality of the infrastructural deficit in Nigeria and the fact that people are not comfortable with remote working as of today in Nigeria. So I think... so. so Again, I think this is why the culture of Iroko is really r robust in this kind of scenario. So I, I live on a plane. I spend about 6% of my time traveling. So I'm never actually in the Iroko office. So if you go to the Iroko office, I don't have an office there. In London, in New York, in Accra, in Lagos, I don't have an office there because I'm, I'm not there enough to have an actual office. So for the last few years, I've never had an office. I'm always traveling. So I am remote anyway. My CTO sits in, um, in, uh, in New York. My CFO uh, up until recently sat in London and I sit between Lagos and Ghana. So for all intents and purposes, we are essentially, our leadership is remote anyway. Like I might see my CTO like twice or maybe three times a year. I might see my CFO like four or five times a year. So we're not used to seeing ourselves anyway. And more importantly, like the people who, we who report to the, us as the organization, they're not used to seeing us anyway. So uh, before, the, um, before the sort of lockdown started, uh, we had been building tools to uh, remotely manage and monitor our employees anyway. So a big part of our employees' bases are outbound or our kind of tele-sales team. We were building tools anyway for those guys. So from the devices they have, what they can use, do with those devices, uh, we, we actually managed our, we have a device management system which is run out of New York so you literally can't do anything with that device without us knowing about it or without us giving you permission so we kind of control it that way uh, we, 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 we wanted to build our own CRM system uh, no we wanted to we, we couldn't buy a CRM system which worked in our environment so we basically built one which worked in low sort of like low bandwidth low sort of data environments in Nigeria mostly works offline so a lot of the tools that we use for Iroko today in terms of how we run the business we built these things before the pandemic because we as a company are remote and i think he, he, here is where um i guess my paranoia um is just like a, a positive thing so anyone who's met me over the last year i've been going on and on and on about the zombie apocalypse i believe there's a zombie apocalypse i believe there's zombie movies i prepare for them i literally i prepare for them so when this thing started moving i got my masks i've stopped having food I got medicines, I got everything to basically last the rest of the year without having to leave my house. I basically had that in place before there was any lockdowns, before there was one case in Nigeria. Before um, uh, 
like there was any government related lockdowns i was literally telling people we need to think of how we cancel 2020 we need to figure out how we essentially be remote for the rest of the year so i think it was on the 17th of march i was like guys we're going remote so before lagos state said anything before ghana said anything we essentially gone remote anyway so that two weeks of being remote we saw the challenges that people were having immediately so if it's power banks you need if it's like connectivity you need if it's low latency you need like all the things that uh, were causing problems post the uh, the lockdowns. We basically had two week head start to solve them. So in terms of productivity, I literally can see on an hourly basis what my entire team is doing in terms of the number of calls they're logging, number of minutes they're speaking to, how many people they're speaking to. I can see the sales coming on an hourly hour basis. We track these things. We have daily calls every day at six, uh, sorry, four, four o'clock uh, West Africa time, um, and we basically track these things on a daily basis. So I can kind of see what the entire organization is doing. So for us, it's like, it's, it, it's less about your ability to do the job. It's about whether you want to do the job and if you can do the job. So there are some people who literally, I will send a message to you and then you basically won't respond to like a day later. Like you're telling me you're working. I'm not too sure you're working, but you know what? It's fine. We left it for six weeks. We'll see how things progress. So for us, you know, in Rocco, it's not, we're not, we're not singing Kumbaya. We're not a family. I see us as a high performance team. If you perform, you have no problems. If you don't perform, then we have a problem. If the company is not performing, then if the company is not performing the way we need to perform and you are contributing to that not lack of performance, I'm not going to run around. I'm not going to chase you around. You're an adult. If you want to work, work. If you don't want to work, no problem. Don't work. It's as simple as that. So for me, it's, um, I'm all about productivity. If I require you to make, let's say, five sales per day, if you wake up for one hour and you make those five sales and then you go back to bed, what's my own? You've done your work. If I don't see you online for the entire day and you tell me that this one's happening, that one's happening, this one's happening, it's just story. And we have like almost 300 data points across Ghana and Nigeria at that point to tell broadly what's happening with people. So I think the ability for us as an organization to be super paranoid, and again, that, that definitely comes from me, um, so we locked down in New York. So we'd gone offline in New York. We'd gone offline in um, London. We'd gone offline in Nigeria way before um, there was any sort of like government um, uh, mandated lockdowns. More importantly, like I have no plans to go into any offices uh, for the rest of 2020. So as an organization, people realize that this isn't, oh, I'm going to go back to the office next week. I'll catch up later on. No, because, because I'm not going to, I have no plans to go in any of my offices. For the rest of 2020, what kind of what does this organization look to, need to look like? And that was when we started realizing, well, actually, you know what? These people we actually can't just support them for the rest of the year like this. These people we can't support them for the rest of the year like this. If something miraculous happens and we all can kind of get back to work in a very positive and normal way, they're fantastic. But then if we can't, then we can't. So we need to basically make uh decisions based on what our doomsday assumption is, is where our revenues drop in half, and then our, um, our, uh, our, 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 our inability to be in the office for the rest of the year just manifests itself. So we're basically budgeting on what I call the doomsday scenario. Um, and we, every year we have a doomsday scenario, and it's usually about running out of money. Now it's really about like, how do we basically keep this business alive? And that was why essentially I've switched my focus to the international business, because between now and devaluation and the, the, the lack of consumer sort of confidence and ability to buy stuff, um, it's made it very difficult for me to kind of get excited about Nigeria, particularly for Iroko TV, at this very particular moment. There's more opportunities, me basically focusing on my North American guys, who pay me $25, $30 a year and not really give me too much stress. Great, interesting. Uh, and, and talking about products, um, there's a question from Simeon, um, and his question is, uh, when would you think about launching a Roku-like product or Netflix integration into TV? Or do you have that? Um, and the other part of the question is, what are you going to be doing going forward, knowing that this pandemic would most likely last for the next three years? Do you advise diversification of markets? I think you've spoken to that. Or do you feel creative verticals would help better in the single market most Nigerian companies are? I'm, I'm doing both. So, 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 if you, so if you look at um, Iroko TV, sort of like H2 2019, after we sold the rock business, we were 100% go on there, you buy another movies, that's it. 
in January this year, we added uh, Bollywood telenovelas, India, so Bollywood telenovelas, Korean kids content. That now represents 20% of our new subscribers being added to the service. So my ambition by the end of the year is to get to a point where like Nollywood content represents like 25, 30% of my revenues. So I'm aggressively using product diversification um, in Nigeria and Ghana specifically um, to change what people would expect Iroko to be. So like right now, I think geographical diversification, 100%. And fucking uh, as fast and as hard as you can, like product diversification, absolutely. Because my sense is that, like, um, how do I get thirty dollars a year from you? Like, how, like, how can I get? What, what's the exchange rate now? Uh, it's like four hundred and fifty, right? So, how can I figure out how to get, um, you know, thirteen? Let's say between thirteen and fifteen thousand an hour a year from you. If I can sell you as my customer multiple things at multiple price points, then do you know what? I can do that rather than trying to find new and new and new customers. So I'm more focused on retention and existing customers and growing our ARPU in 2020 and 2021 than I am actually interested in, um, in, in absolute number of subscribers. And, and it's interesting, like I, 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 I use this example because, so I'll be very public about my, my want to essentially list Iroko. Um, my ambition was 2021, we might probably push out to 2022, but 100% I will list Iroko once I feel I'm comfortable at a hundred million dollar plus valuation. So, if you look at it from a really sort of simple perspective, if I'm just selling my Nollywood as it is, you're paying 3,000 Naira a year, 3,000 Naira again before, 3,000 Naira before was, um, you know, $8.3. Now 3,000 Naira is, you know, $6.6. .6. So if I have a million subscribers pay me 3,000 Naira a year, I've just gone from $8.3 million in revenue to $6.6 .6 million in revenue. I've done nothing, nothing has changed, but Nigeria has happened and I've basically just lost a significant chunk of, uh, of value for the company. Now imagine now it goes to like 550. So at 550, my $8.3 million a year business has just gone to like $5.4 million a year. And that is a problem that a lot of Nigerian companies will face over the next three years. Like this narrow devaluation destroys so much value. And it's very difficult to outgrow that. So if you're growing at four times and then the, now, now is the value of 50%, you're basically, that you're, grow, you're growing only two times. So very few companies can basically outgrow that. So my view is that like, if I have product diversification in Nigeria and Ghana, and Ghana less so because their, their currency is, is, is doing fairly well this year. Um, but if I have product diversification, I can then add something else. So rather than just accepting the fact that I've lost, you know, that value, I can now add another service to them. I can add another service to them. I can add another service to them. So my view is that like, I want to grow ARPU. So again, a million subscribers pay me, you know, 3,000 naira a year each is 8.3 million dollars of business. Wow, fantastic. But a million subscribers who are paying me like, uh, let's say 15,000 uh, naira a year, um, even, if that not, even if the naira the values to uh, 550, uh, I still have a, uh, I still have a, I think it's a uh, 27 million dollar a year business. No, sorry, that's wrong, the wrong math is wrong. Sorry, dollars. Oh, it's built up. Yeah, so a 15,000 so 15, uh, Naira per member of the Iroko community per year, even if the Naira is at 550, uh, 550 Naira to a dollar, with a million subscribers, I still have a $27 million a year business. So the, the, the business is less about like the number of subscribers is more about how much value can you basically give to them and how much can you sort of collect back from them. So right now, like we're all about product diversification. We're all about figuring out what more can I basically, um, what more can I offer you that you'd be happy to pay me a thousand hour here, two thousand hour here to add up to the point where I'm taking 15,000 hour a year from you. And I, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's really important. I most remember that like most, uh, most businesses are scale in, in, in Nigeria don't usually take more than, I would say $30 from their customers. MTN barely takes $30 a year from their customers. GoTV barely takes $30 uh, per year from their customers. So for us, if we can get to that, if we can get to that $25 to $30 uh, a year bracket, then I think we're, we're, in sort of, we're in kind of a great place. And if we can then scale that um, north of a million, then we'll be a, a couple of hundred million dollar valued company and everyone will be happy. So I think for us, it's geographical diversification to deal with currency, 
but it also is the 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 uh, the, uh, the the product diversification to do with actual um, the the value you can actually extract from a particular market. Interesting. And talking about pricing, there's an, there's this interesting question for you, um, Jason. So this question is from Derek, and his question is: Looking at Iroko TV's pricing of three to five k naira per year, how do you really do it? I've seen many investors worried about how low price about low pricing in startups. So do you know how we did it? It's very simple, and I've said this, and I'll say it over again. It was rock. Do you know? Do you know Iroko TV's content cost for from 2015, when we almost went out of business, to 2019 was zero. Just think about that for a second. Like if you look at Netflix, if you look at any big content uh, sort of streaming platform, by far the number one biggest cost is content. Ours was zero. In fact, we were profitably creating and distributing content. It was rock. So we, the only reason we had to charge those ultra low prices was because of what? Because our deals with uh, paid TV operators, our deals with like uh, third party distributors, etc., basically paid for the content. So it w if, if there was no rock, if we hadn't been able to diversify and build rock and blitz scale it the way we were able to blitz scale it, Iraq would have died back in 2016, 17. Like, like we would have died a long time ago. I, I, I say that over and over again. So the fact that we we're able to, uh, to diversify our product and adjust the company so quickly over like a five year period with very little capital. And I think what, what, I, what I really stress about here is that like Rock spent, we, we spent no more than, uh, I think it was about $1.4 million. And we, we basically got a BOI loan for 500 million Naira. And we paid that loan back in 13 months. And we basically, you know, sold that company for tens of millions of dollars. So like, you know, that, that is what product diversification can do if you're really aggressive with it and you're really expansive with it. Um, and uh, you have value which people didn't see before. And I, I, I think for me, it's like, it's, as a company, our number one sort of uh, value point is be bold. Everything we do, we just basically want to fucking crush it. And if we can't crush it, we'll invest the money. If we lose, let us lose valiantly. Let us lose with our sword in our hands, right? But that's kind of how we think about these things. So for me, I, I think, you know, when I was building that rock, like, there were, I had no support from my board. I had no support from my co-founder. The only person who really supported me uh, was Mary. The organization didn't support me when I was building that and spending all my time building rock. They thought, was, they thought it was a waste of my fucking time. But they ended up saving the company. You know, we sold, we sold our business for tens of millions of dollars. Uh, interesting. And, and there's, a, there's a question from Ivo Kuhn, um, and this question is around... Um, what do you advise a startup that just launched in the African travel market? What can they do to stay alive? I'm assuming this, this is really important to him because of the fact that travel has been grounded and it's probably going to stay grounded for the next, next couple of months. So his question is, what can he do to stay alive? So, absolute nightmare. Whatever you do to stay alive, you must stay alive. Um, you know, I, I don't think I can say any more than that. So if you look at hotels.ng, completely like value destroyed immediately. So if you look at like one of my other companies, consumer companies I invested in, um, uh, Ogre Venue. Ogre Venue, like if there's no events, <laughs> what, what, is, what happens to your business, right? But again, like when I, you know, I, been, I, mean, I haven't spoken to the guys, I've been WhatsApping them, I've been trying to give them a sense of like, you know, what they need to do. But the first thing I ask them is to do cut your costs. 100% cut your costs. I, I, you know, I was telling marketers, they're like, dude, whatever you can cut, just cut it. Like, what's your cash? Can I cash last year for the next two years? Just cut, 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 cut. Even if it's cutting back to you in your room, basically figure that thing out by yourself, fucking cut. He pulled back at that, and ultimately he's making his own decisions. From my view, that like whatever cash you have, conserve it, and assume zero, assume zero revenue for the foreseeable future. So like the 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 aggressive cost cutting that you saw in Rocco, other companies that I was I'm involved in, I've done that like. Basically, I'd done that in March, and I was super aggressive in asking the guys to, to cut costs. 50% salary cuts right across the board. Um, unfortunately, like 30, 40% team layoffs. In the end, like, you have to survive, right? It, 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 it's in no one's best interest if the entire company goes down um, when you could have done something about it. So for me, I think uh, if, you, if you, like, have a mindset where, like, can I basically sit in my room, in my house, and basically run this business, 
on like 10 gigabytes worth of data on a monthly basis. If you can't do that, then you're basically going to be screwed. Because I think this scenario we're in lasts at least for the rest of 2020 and maybe, maybe the new normal for the, rest of, for, the, for, the, for the foreseeable future. But with that said, I'm actually a big investor um, um, in, uh, uh, in buying like travel stocks. So I believe that travel will come back. I think that it's more depressing than it will ever be in our lifetimes. So for me, I believe it will come back in some way, shape or form. So I think now is the time to invest because you know what? No one else is invested. So I think you, you, you should definitely c control your costs and bring them down. But when I'm talking about being ambitious, nah, swing for the fences, man. Like, fuck that. Like, be as aggressive as you can. Because you know what? Most people will just figure out, like, about shrinking their costs and then they'll try to stay there and survive. But surviving is not fun. Figure out what you can do, which is super ambitious, which is super crazy, which doesn't cost you much, huge amounts of money to do, and just go ahead and do that. And I actually think people will be more receptive to that now than they would have been any, at any other time. Great. And just to, just to, just to follow on to that, at what point um, as a founder do you decide that this is not working? I need to shut this down. Oh, I'm, I'm terrible at that. Um, I, I like I, I'm the worst person to ask especially because you know what like I get so emotionally involved with my startups um, that I typically found that I'm literally the last person to kind of like realize when it's too late but with that said you know there was a time when uh, Bastion my mom my friends were like hey this thing you're doing man it's not gonna work man like maybe you're gonna get a job so there was a lot of pressure in 20 in 2009 to get a job. And in the end, I actually, I actually ended up getting a job for like two or three months. You know, I, was, I was fired pretty quickly because I, I wasn't a corporate guy. Um, in, 20, in 2010, actually, whilst I was building in Morocco, uh, so the first year, my, after, between my first trip to Nigeria, I essentially kind of like was working, um, building websites and doing other kind of like other weird stuff. Um, and when I say building websites, I was basically putting up, um, I was building Shopify stores and putting up WordPress blogs. That's basically what I was doing. Um, so for, for, um, for all intents and purposes, I think, um, yeah, you know, you just have to do what you have to do, right? And I think that's, that's, the, that, that's, that's the key thing. You have to just tune out the noise and do what you think is in your best interest. I, I, I believe that the business must stop you rather than you stop the business. Okay, uh, uh, interesting way to look at that. Um, so speaking to your, your, your thoughts around expansion and geographical expansion, there are a bunch of questions around that. I'm just going to try and aggregate all the thoughts together. Um, the general question is, um, how did you, I mean, again, this will probably be different for people. You probably have like a solid network of people spread across multiple countries. But the question for this founder is, how did you go about, you know, um, getting to meet people in these new countries that you expanded to? The second question is around, how did you build a team in those local markets? And the third question is around, how did you approach localization? Here, I'm assuming product localization in terms of language, um, and cultural localization and just like blending the product into the general culture of the country you're operating in? So, um, let me give you a perfect example. So I've never been to Mozambique. Um, earlier this year, I was supposed to go to DRC. I couldn't get a visa on time. So I essentially couldn't get on a flight. So I was like, you know, let me go to Mozambique. Let me go to Mozambique. I hear it's an interesting market. Let me go to Mozambique. At the time I was at um, uh, Johannesburg Airport. Next day, I went to Mozambique. I was, in Mo I was in Maputo for one day. I'm so used to traveling to places that I can get a feel and a sense of a place and the people, I believe, really quickly because I'm used to it. So I think there are some things that I could do uh, because I'm used to traveling to loads of places and never spending more than like two or three days in any particular place. So I can, I can literally, I can be in three countries in a week and I do that like 20 times a year. So I think if you are okay to land in the city, get a cab driver, just have them drive you around. You know, stop at shops, go to local markets, just get a sense of like what people are doing. But more importantly, like, you know, for example, for, 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 for the sports betting business, I essentially like, uh, I got a SIM 
I got I got some mobile money, and I basically kind of like you know used every single every single uh, I think there's like twelve operators in Mozambique. I signed up and used every single one of their services, and just by using and using using their sort of product, I could instantly see that these these are the these are the basic expectations of what people what people uh, believe is the product here. So I have a baseline expectation. Um, you get a sense of in terms of if you look at twelve competitor sites and sports betting is one of the most competitive I think consumer plays in Africa at the moment um, if you look what, what languages are people using and why if they're all using um, uh, Swahili then you just use Swahili you don't have to think about it like you know if they're all using uh, this particular thing you have to figure out why and if you then look at well what is most that being doing versus Nigeria versus Ghana versus Kenya you then get sort of like a more strategic and global view and I think like because I'm used to sort of being in like Every month I could be in like five to six different countries because I'm used to that. I can see things very, very quickly. And actually, like, you know, if you stay at hotels a lot, you, if, you, if you literally go to the, the lobby of a hotel, if you ask the hotel people, they can pretty much tell you everything. Hey, why is this? Why is that? How much is this? How much is that? Is this a lot of money? What can you do with it? You know, I, I, and I think like if you have a very open mindset and I, I usually ask people, when you go to a new market, have write down 100 questions and see if you can answer those questions. See if you can find people to answer those questions um, in, uh, uh, in, in, in one day. So 100 questions, just ask these people these questions and see what questions or answers they come back with. Collate them together and just gives you a sense of like what a, what a particular market is. Um, so I think being able to speed read the market is something which you acquire with time. Um, you know, do, that, when I went to Mozambique, did I know anyone in Mozambique? No, I didn't. But to me, it didn't matter. To me, like, I didn't need to know anybody at that point in time. But that taxi driver, I still ask him questions now. Hey, dude, what's this? No, 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 what's that? You know, th thankfully, he speaks and writes good English. So I was like, hey, what's this? What's that? And that taxi driver, he was saying, that, hey, what you're doing is really excited that if you come to Mozambique, you know, I would love to be part of the team. And, I, and I, there's, there's, a, there's a manager for, for the Black Bay East Africa. And I, I, when, when he went to Mozambique, I connected with him. So for me, like someone as simple as like the guy who drives the, the, the taxi for you can be a great resource and could probably be a good sort of eyes and ears to a market um, if you can answer the questions in a really kind of coherent and normal way. So I, I think, you know, Mozambique, the first employee will be the person who happened to basically drive me around the day or so that I was there. So I think there was, like, you don't have to have a deep network of people to be able to kind of go to a place and create a deep network of people. And I, I think, you know, and one good thing about Nigeria and one bad thing about Nigeria is that as a Nigerian, the music, the movies, the churches precede whatever you're doing. So whenever you speak to anybody else outside of Nigeria, they have a preconception of what a Nigerian is. They love Lagos, they love Afrobeats, they love whiskey, they love all these things. So they want to speak to you. And if you ask them questions, they typically are happy to give you the normal answers. There's no sort of like edge, there's no shade, there's no trying to kind of like, you know, make it into a maga. They just want to kind of provide information because that's how they feel they want to communicate. So I think if you ask enough questions, it's really, really easy to get most of the answers you're looking for, at least from my experience. So yeah, I don't, I, again, when I landed in Malawi, I did, I did not, never been to Malawi before. Did not have a deep network of people in Malawi. But the moment I landed in Malawi and I was like, hey, Twitter, I'm, I'm in Malawi, people then started reaching back to me and you know, connecting with different people and stuff like that. So I think if you land in a country like, hey guys, to Twitter or to Facebook or whatever, I'm in this country, anyone want to have coffee or anyone want to meet up, I think you find people who willing to have that conversation with you. Especially if you know how to use hotels. Hotels are the great, they're great resources for anything you want to do um, in order to, to sort of build a network in the country. And I think if you can, I would state the best, I would find the best hotel in the country and try and stay there. And it, I think it's rich me saying that. But again, like the best hotel in, uh, in, in, uh, in Blantyre, for example, Malawi, costs like $130 a, a night, which is a lot of money, but it's not really a lot of money, right? But in that hotel, you will get a sense of like the business community, people doing dinners, people doing lunches. Like they'll have a sense of like how to connect you with the right people. When I was going to Mozambique, I was like, what's the number one hotel in Mozambique? There's two or three of them. I stayed in, I think it was the uh, Madison Blue, whatever it was. $200 a night, whatever it was. It wasn't hugely expensive, but I was able to know that I could tap into a network of people who were used to like foreign visitors coming to come and do business. So you want to stay at the top business hotels in any country that you're in.
Um, interesting, Jason. Uh, we, we're short. I, I see. I see. I still, we still have a bunch of questions. We're short for time. So I would just ask, uh, I'll just take three more questions. I'll just pick questions at random and just ask those questions. And hopefully we can wrap this up in the next 10 to 15 minute tops. Um, Jason, there's a question around cryptocurrencies and your thoughts around cryptocurrencies. And um, the question is specifically, what are your views on cryptocurrencies and its potential impact on your betting consolidation thesis? Um, so I think first and foremost, I read two books uh, on cryptocurrency. One was um, Confessions of a Crypto Millionaire, where a guy basically was trading in crypto and made $10 million. The other one was uh, Bitcoin Billionaires, which was about the, um, uh, the Winklevi, um twins. Um, sort of like, I guess, uh, everyone will know who they are. I read those two books out of just general interest. Um, I don't have a wallet. I've never even like, yeah, I don't have a wallet, so I, I, I don't really understand anything about Bitcoin. Um, I understand the value proposition in terms of what people want to do with it. Um, but again, like I am a very, um, I'm a very sort of like narrow and deep kind of person. I don't know too much, but what I do know about, I try to know more than anybody else around me. Uh, or at least be at least at a stage where I can at least have a, a, a strong argument about anything around that particular subject. So I don't really, I can't really have an opinion on Bitcoin because I literally have no idea. I'm, I'm, again, I, I've never opened a wallet for Bitcoin, so I have no idea. In terms of his consolidation, um, in terms of his consolidation, I think this is, this, this is probably what's more interesting for FinTech. Um, so for example, in Nigeria, Iwoko TV has about, we have about 20 ways you can pay. We have USSD across all the different banks, all the rest of that shit. We have like, obviously we have Paystack, we have a whole bunch of other stuff that we, uh, people use to pay. So we have like 20 bank accounts, something crazy like that. Um, in Ghana, 97% of our subscribers come via MTN mobile money. We don't even have USSD or a card payment option. And do you know what? It doesn't matter. In Kenya, we have Mpesa and we have Airtel money. Other than that, it doesn't fucking matter. In Zambia, the same. In, uh, in, 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 um, in Tanzania, the same. So I, I, I think one thing that Nigeria, I think, is way, way, way behind it is just the, uh, the power of, um, of mobile money. So for the betting play, like the masses use mobile money. So if you're not essentially collecting mobile money, you're basically not in the game. Like, I, I, again, like I, I've looked at about 100 different betting sites across 10 different countries. Like, Outside of Nigeria, I can't remember any. Outside of South Africa and Nigeria, I can't remember any which actually had a, uh, a card or a bank transfer payment option. The vast majority of them is just mobile money. So if you want to scale across seven or eight countries, so right now Blackbird is trying to scale across 10 countries in 2020, you plug into mobile money, you're good to you're you're basically you're good to you're good to work, and more importantly, mobile money is much much more secure in terms of being able to manage that centrally. So again, how, you know, how do you centrally manage uh, sort of ten countries with mobile money? Um, it's actually pretty easy compared to like trying to do with like you know a thousand different bank accounts. Uh, in interesting take. Uh, I'm just going to ask the last two questions and I'm just going to take them um, together. Um, apologies for all the questions. We, for everybody that's written in and we couldn't take their questions, what I've tried to do is basically just match or aggregate questions that looked similar and ask some of those questions. Um, but then again, um, if we couldn't take your questions, uh, sincere apology, I'm sure you probably can hit Jason up on Twitter and just basically ask him, you know, some of those questions if we're not able to address them here today. So the last, I'll take two more questions and I'll just wrap it up. So there's a question from OO um, and he says, um, based on your experience in the past 10 years, I have to commend your transparency about your business. It's very un-African. What have been the pros and the cons of this? And the last question from Osato, his question is, what major trends or changes have you seen in the startup slash VC, VC ecosystem since you entered in 2009? Okay. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, I believe I have seen zero downside of being transparent. 
That's my personal belief. If there is a downside, I'm yet to see it. It's interesting. Um, one of my investors, I was like, hey, I want to put Iroko TV's revenues out there so everyone can see. Just be like this open, transparent company. He was like, why would you do that? Um, I'm like, because like, you know, in the end, like, what's the downside? He was like, oh, people will, people will now know that you're smaller than, um, you know, what they think you are. I'm like, oh, we are smaller than what people think we are. So why would that be a bad thing? He's like, oh, you know, investors might not be attracted. I'm like, what? What is the point of an investor coming in thinking you're really big? If an investor comes in thinking you're a twenty million dollar a year company, and you're making like five million dollars a year profit, and then they come and you're oh actually wait hold on, you're making like three or four million dollars a year in revenue, and there's actually this other business which is paying for all these losses that you're making. Like I like I don't get. So for me like it's like it's in the end. In the end, do I care if my competitors know the size of my business? No, not really. Do I care if investors know the size of my business? In the end, if you, if you want to invest in my business, you will see that anyway. So for me, I don't see any downside of the secret society style of things that we do here. So for me, I genuinely don't understand how things are. If it was up to me, and my board has really restrained me on this for the longest time, I would share more. And even like, you know, I, 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 like, I, I've been sort of you know, kind of cuffed in terms of what I wanted to share and what, how I wanted to do it. I would share more because in the end, I think like, I, I don't really see what the downside is. When you say um, when you say share more, Jason, similar to Joel Gaskell style buffer, share revenue numbers, share employee salaries, share um, every single thing. So I, I wouldn't share employee salaries because I don't think that's fair. And I don't think that's my choice. If employees want their salaries to be shared, then I will allow that to be shared. But I wouldn't just share employee salaries. Would I share revenues and our metrics? Absolutely. Like absolutely. Because in the end, like what like it, in the end, it's your business, right? If you're doing well, you're doing well. If you're not doing well, then you're not doing well. And that's okay too. The thing is like, I, this, this fake it till you make it, it doesn't work. Like this fake it till you make it, I'm sorry. In the end, when you're looking for an outcome, which is a profitable business where you can run for the next 20, 30 years, or you're looking for a sell, I can assure you this fake it till you make it does not work with somebody who wants to buy your company. I went through six months of due diligence, long, Lawyers, accountants, consultants, all fucking calling over the rock to understand what the business was. Like 300 point um, due diligence questions for finance, 200 point due diligence questions for legal, all the rest of this stuff, contracts, interviews of our customers, confirmations of contracts, cash in the bank. Like you can't fucking fake that shit. You can't fake that shit. So if you have a very profitable business, you either have that business or you don't have that business. So for me, I just, I, I just, I don't see the point of being um, uh, intransparent about it. Uh, um, at the same time, like, is there a personal risk that, um, you know, someone may try and kidnap me? Like, you have to see me to kidnap me. And as I said, the vast majority of people never see me. Like, I'm not in a nightclub throwing it up. I, you, you, most people don't even know what country I'm in most of the time. Most people don't even know who I am. And the only person who knows where I am on an ongoing basis is my wife. And sometimes she can get... She even forgets as I'm darting across Africa. She, the first question is like, Jason, what country are you in? Because in the morning I could be in uh, Malawi, in the afternoon I'm in, I'm in Tanzania. So you don't know where I am, so safety is not a concern of mine. And more importantly, I'm a paranoid guy anyway. So even before all of this stuff, like, you know, I've been, I've been, like, I've been moving with Mopo and armed security for like a very long time. And people are like, who are you? Why are you? Why are you even on the screen? I just care about my safety. I'm just proud that someone's going to come and get me. So, but again, like, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't have any impact on my ability to be transparent. I, naturally, I'm a very transparent person. And if you meet me in person, there is nothing. There is nothing that I will not tell you. And I actually, Colin's Col on the line. Colin, um, uh, Col you're on the line, right? You're still on yeah, the line? I am. I am. I am on the line. Colin, there was an email that I sent to some of the shareholders of Black Bear, like two weeks ago. Yeah, email. Two weeks uh, ago, I was like, dude, Jason, I, I, I have to say, I haven't seen that level of transparency. I mean, I don't want to say what it is, but, you know, I got that no, I'm, email. I'm going to tell you what it is. No, <laughs> I'm, so, no, I, I, put, I had a choice. No, no, let me, let me say, I had a choice. I could put $300,000 into Black Bear with my wife, or I could basically buy a house that I've been promising my wife for the, since, for the last eight or nine years. Do you know what I did? I put it into Black Bear. And you know what? I almost defaulted on getting my, I almost lost my house in January, February this year because I did that. And you know what? I didn't hide it from the investors. I was like, guys, this is what fucking happened, though. 
I believe in this thing. It's going to work, but this is what I had to do. And I did it. I didn't ask God's permission. I just did it. Because I'm, I'm stupid like that. And in the end, I, like, in the end, like, Carla, I would like to think that whatever I say, you will listen to because I shared stuff that no fucking Nigerian man in his right mind will share. Why would, why would you do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no ego. When it comes to me, people think I have an ego. There is no ego. I'm here to build something. If I'm winning, I'm winning. If I'm failing, at least I know that I went down with my sword in my hand. So I, I've never seen a downside of transparency. And I, I, don't, I don't believe in faking it. You make it. You either make it or you don't. It's as simple as that. Interesting. I mean, the, 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 the falling down your sword part, I mean, it's pretty interesting. I mean, the last question, which I think you, you didn't take, was uh, what major trends and changes have you seen in the, in the ecosystem um, since you entered into it? And uh, I will just wrap, we'll just wrap the session with that question. Okay. So I think uh, we've had, strangely enough, we've had probably the best five years of tech and investment I think we've ever had in Nigeria's history. More people are being funded, better companies are being built. I think it's fantastic. I think, and again, crazy, Kevin, for me, I think valuations are out of step with reality. I think a lot of the money coming in don't, doesn't understand this market. I think they don't, they'll now really understand it after they go through valuation. Uh, again, imagine telling your, your San Francisco based investor that, hey, last year my revenue was 1 million, this year my revenue is 1 million. That is a conversation. I, you know, I, I grew in Naira terms like three times but my, my revenues are still basically the same. That's, a, that's, that's where people understand what the valuation is. Like a lot of, a lot of uh, US investors or European investors haven't really an understanding of what a big devaluation looks like. When, the, the, when Brexit happened in the UK, people lost, the pound lost like, I think it was like 10% and the world was shaken. People were worried about whether they could pay their mortgages. Everything was fucking going crazy. Wait till you get like a 50%, 60% devaluation, and then you understand what was will. So I think there's I think there's there's too much money, which is always a good thing, but it's too much money and too big of valuations to be able to grow into that. I think it's, I think there's gonna be a lot of consolidation in this space. But I think that's a good thing because I think strong companies will get built. Um, and tourists will basically leave. And I think that's that's, that's never a bad thing. So I think the big thing is that more money in the industry, I think, is fantastic. I think the quality of the entrepreneurs is way, way, way better. Um, than when I first landed here. And I think more importantly, the kind of people who are building these companies, they're not people who like me. I think that's probably the biggest shift in the last three to five years that I've seen. The people who are getting funded in Nigeria are Nigerians. I think that's when you start to see like a real, real, real um, uh, ecosystem being built. It shouldn't be sort of funded to guys named Jason. It's Shola. It's people like that. It's people who are like, you know, who are building real things that from their perspective, and it's basically being built like in real, in, in real ways based on sort of real revenue, real, real things. I think the valuations are out of sync, but I think good thing is that like Nigerians are being invested in. And again, like we, we take this for granted, but if you go to Kenya, it's not like that. If you go to South Africa, it's not like that. Local guys are not really getting funded like that. So I think that's the big shift. I think it's a great shift. Um, I think uh, in terms of my excitement for the space in, uh, in, in, in Africa, there is no space I will be more, I, I, there's no space I, I'm more excited in being in right now than the tech and entertainment space. Like I, I, I think whatever happens, tech and entertainment come out stronger. Because in the end, like people are now being forced, organizations are now being forced to be digital, to be thinking about productivity, to be thinking about how people work. You know, thinking about their space, thinking about how like you know, people. I'm literally, I'm, I'm having these conversations. I've got like, I've got my slippers on. I'm wearing like, I'm wearing uh, shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> and the message is still coming across. That's a good thing. You know, I, I, it's a good thing. It's not suit and tie anymore. Fuck that shit. Let space survive. Like, and, and it goes on, and that's a great thing. So, I, if Nigeria. And have looked more like us tech guys in Nigeria. For it. I think there's no better space that I'd rather be in tech and entertainment, especially as a young person, because outside of tech and entertainment, I struggle to see what we can be doing to be honest with you. Great, great. Um, well, what a great way to end the webinar, right? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Jason. It was, it's been really good just learning from you and just hearing you share your perspective on this call. 
Um, thank you so much for joining the call. And thanks to everyone also for joining the call. Um, to, thank you to for wrap, having me. To wrap, oh, thank you so much, Jason. To wrap this up, I'm just going to have Kola, you know, with founding partner Adventures Platform, just share some of his thoughts around some of the things Jason has mentioned and also his thoughts around, you know, building in the current um, climate, the post, both pre and post COVID climate we're currently in. And on that note, after Kola's talk, we'll basically just end the call. Thanks, thanks, Kaide. Um, I'm, I'm not going to give a talk because I don't think there's, any, there's much else to add to what Jason has said. Um, I just want to sort of emphasize, uh, thanks, J thank, thanks, Jason, for really being candid. I mean, one of the things I've admired about Jason for as long as I've known him is just his candor and his, his willingness to share. I mean, Jason referred to an email. So, so I'm an investor in Jason's betting business, you know, as an angel investor. And, and one of the things that, you know, um, that, that has shocked me the most is just his, his, his the level of candor, uh, that only matches his level of aggressiveness. You know, we've, we've seen, I've seen a level of sort of, and, and I call it the Rambo spirit. I, I'm, I don't know if you guys ever watched Rambo as kids. So sort of that willingness to just keep going and never, and never dying. But, but when you match that with a, with, a, with a very, very radical candor and honesty, which isn't very common, I think, I think it's very clear to see why Jason and his businesses have been very successful, you know. Um, and so, you know, j just to double down, I think clearly there are lots of headwinds ahead for the continent. And, you know, we can't, there's no gain saying that we're likely to have a devaluation. We're likely to see a shrink uh, in spending power. But the reality is Adventures Platform, we believe, like Jason has said, there's no better time than when all the odds are stacked up high. To, uh, there's no better time to create and to build. The only way you get out of a situation of this magnitude is by building new things. And so, and, and so this is why, you know, Adventures, Kaede and I, we remain really bullish, sort of about supporting and partnering with founders that are building capital efficient businesses. Jason mentioned that, you know, you know, being able to sort of be super capital efficient, have very low burn rates, uh, uh, that are really solving the real critical problems we have in the continent, right? So how do you democratize prosperity? How do you plug the gaps in infrastructure? How do you connect underrepresented communities? And how, you know, how do you solve for non-consumption? Like these are the things we're focused on. And you know, we, we're really keen to sort of support folks that would be as bold and as candid as Jason has been you know, on, on, on his journey. Jason, thank you very much. And, you know, really looking forward to thank you. the future for Iroko Partners and everything else that you're building. And, and guys, Jason has a blog. The challenge is you have to pay to, to read the blog, you know. So, Jason, I'm plugging the blog here. Uh, what's, what's the, is, is it the same URL as the old blog? <laughs> Jason.com.ng. Very simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, trust me, if you want more of, of these sort of, you know, sort of raw candor, sign up to Jason's blog and, and, and stay up to date. Thank you very much, Jason. And thanks everyone for signing up. Thanks, Kaede, for moderating this. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been incredible. Thanks, Kola. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone. Um, and true, true that, I mean, I can attest to, 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 the, to the depth of content on Jason's blog. I mean, I'm a paid subscriber, so it's been pretty interesting. So I encourage you guys, I think it's about 10K a year. So please head to jason.com.ng, sign up for more insights. And thanks to everyone for joining this call. We really appreciate um, the time you've spent with us on the call. Um, and we wish you the very best as you keep building your businesses. Um, cheers, everyone. And thanks for joining the call once again. Thank you, everybody.